Good evening. I'm Richard Boogs. Welcome. I'm the Dean of Alumni here at the California Institute of Integral Studies, where we just celebrated our 50-year anniversary. We couldn't be prouder. We're so delighted to be hosting tonight's conversation. Let's talk about death over dinner. Michael's book has been called A Trail Guide. Michael Hebb, our author who's here, has been called A Trail Guide that coaches people on how to lead this difficult conversation with loved ones and friends. It has been launched in multiple countries and languages, including Australia, India, and Brazil. He's been hosting dinners for over 20 years and states that the project isn't really about death at all but about giving people the permission and the guidance to connect deeply with the people in their lives, which I think is the real secret to happiness. So Michael came down from Seattle where he lives in Capitol Hill and he has a wide ranging number of projects up there including the Cloud Room, the City Arts Festival, the Creative Food and Discourse Based Agency Convivian, and also is a partner in Round Glass. So please join me and welcoming Michael Hebb, who will introduce our other special guest for the evening. Oh, by the way, please silence your devices, and we will have questions and answers afterwards. We won't be recording that part of the evening, and Michael will also be available to sign books uh, when we finish. Okay, Michael Hebb. <laughs> oh, I think I've got this. Um, so I'm going to be very brief right now um, because we're going to start with the sound bath. Um, but first, um, thank you for coming out. I know, like, California is on fire, um, and and so it means even more that you made time today. Um, so before, because we've all come from our crazy days, I thought um, death isn't uh, a topic that we just enter into, you know, straight from <laughs> a meeting or a series of um, other things. It actually does require a little bit of sacred space. Um, which luckily, um, thank you, Richard, for having me. To being here at um, CIIS, um, it's easy when you say, hey, I know we're doing this talk, but I want to start with a sound bath. Um, and, you know, generally people, if you're a bookstore, they're like, yeah, that's just not going to be on the program. Um, but that was an easy yes. Um, and I um, turned to Rebecca Feynman and said, would you please come and grace us um, with uh, your work? And she said, absolutely. Rebecca's a yoga teacher, a sound healer, a dietitian, and, and a guide over in um, Oakland. And so we're just going to, for the next 10 to 15 minutes, um, just let the sounds hit the room, and then we'll start the discussion. Um, so um, I'm going to put it in Rebecca's um, very capable hands, and then we'll be back with Laurel in a sec. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Michael, and good evening to all of you. Really grateful for the opportunity to join you all this evening and offer some sound to help us ground into this space, this experience. While studying yoga in India some time ago, one of my teachers taught us that yoga is not just a preparation for living, but a preparation for dying, and that we're doing both every day. So what's the connection between sound and death? My mother, who's a music therapist, would say that sound is used as a tool to help uh, with life recall or uh, life review. Sometimes it's called where you review the memories of your life emerging. It's a natural phenomenon that happens near, near death. And two, it helps process emotions. So sound can be a tool to help us process our emotions and maybe uh, emotions like fear or anxiousness that come as, as we approach death, or um, thoughts like, what about my family? What about my loved ones? Or uh, physical sensations like pain in the body that can come. So I'm really honored to be able to offer some sound, and I'll offer also some um, wisdom from one of the tantric lineages that I've learned from one of my teachers on how we can use sound as a tool to explore this living and dying that we're doing every day. So let's close our eyes and can uncross your legs and flatten your feet. And just start to notice the natural flow of your breath as it's moving in and out of your body.
you might rest your attention on your heartbeat. Just taking a moment to more fully arrive in your body. Ayurveda, life knowledge comes to us from the Indian subcontinent, teaches us that everything is made up of the five elements. And each of those elements corresponds with a sense organ. The sense associated with hearing is ether. supports the belief that hearing is our last sense to go as we near death. Really, as we enter the sound space, it's a listening practice. A couple of stanzas I'll share that have been translated by Harish Christopher Wallace, who's one of my teachers, from the Tantric Krama lineage of Kashmir Shaivism. It comes from the Svaboda Manjari, which means the blossoming of innate awareness. It says this, focus the mind upon something that dissolves. Because it's not grasping anything else, the mind comes to rest in oneself. It's similar to the case of a powerful thunderclap gradually fading when it dies away. The mind, due to being totally focused on it, comes to rest. One should give oneself to one-pointedness as any enchanting sound that comes into one's hearing until the ceasing it brings about the cessation of the mind. In precisely the same way, one may meditate on the beauty of the visible or any other object of the senses after the object perception is dissolved, one should let one's awareness remain empty, clear, not thinking on what is dissolved, what one is attached to, but invigorated by the sense of one, one's own atma bhava, which means immediate being. So you can work with the sound like that, follow it to the end and see where it takes you.
here and resting your attention at your heartbeat. Just take a deep breath in. Open the mouth and exhale. Thank you so much. So now we get a start. Right? <laughs> Room feels a little different. Yeah, it really does. Um, so I get to hang out with my friend Laurel Breitman, um, who many of you probably know, but New York Times bestselling author, anthropologist, um, writer in residence at the Stanford School of Medicine. Is that which you know, like what an amazing thing. <laughs> to be the writer in residence at the School of Medicine. So we'll get into some of that, but um, we met about four years ago snowshoeing um, on <laughs> like a, a horrific day. Like it was sleeting, um, but there was this, we were at this uh, retreat that um, they felt, I think they think that this is a very good rite of passage to as soon as people arrive at this retreat to put on snowshoes and to climb up a mountain um, in the sleet or whatever weather in Park City. And um, there was plenty of grumbling, but Laurel and I, like, we had the best time. Like, <laughs> just like, this is um, what, what incredible fortune. And um, I like to keep magical people close to me. And so um, when I thought about who to be in conversation with here, you were the first person that came to mind. So. Off we go. Awesome. Yeah, I, I tend to choose my friends by uh, who can I talk about death with the fastest uh, <laughs> without scaring them away. Um, and I, I think we got to it really quickly, probably still in the sleet. I can't actually remember what our first conversation was about, but I think that it was right there under the surface. And I, I tend to find out afterwards that people have been touched by loss or been obsessed with death. But, you know, often later I found out they have an early loss or that we share that in some way. And, um, and I can't put words to it at the beginning. And I, I just feel like we were thrumming along on the same plane, um, yeah. which I really appreciate. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for asking me. Of course. Um, if any of you, I'm just going to come right out of the gate with an advertisement because it's way <laughs> less awkward to do it if it's not your own book, trust me. Uh, this is fantastic. Um, I know he's selling them and I'll sign them later. Uh, everyone I know is getting this for the holidays, plus oh. a really good cookbook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're like, thanks. No, it's it's beautiful and it's important, and you know, I am new new to writing about death, and everyone's always greatest fear. I feel like when they come to me is, you know, oh God, I can't handle this right now, right? Or like this is going to be depressing and hard. And my experience reading this was so joyful. Like, I mean, you'll see, I have so many notes everywhere. <laughs> like, he made me laugh, um, and I I think that's the thing. So I I hope that we can. Just start right out of the gate. So the title, Let's Talk About Death Over Dinner, assumes it's important, I guess. And, and I want to know, what are the stakes for this? Like, what do we stand to lose if we don't talk about death, if we don't talk about death over dinner or any other damn place? Wow, what are the stakes? Um, so the thing that I've learned, so I've, got, I've had the pleasure of bringing people together with a lot of, um, a lot of you. Uh, this room is filled with people that um, I've cooked with and sat at tables with on probably every continent um, in this room. Maybe not Antarctica. Um, and you know, I I learned long ago um, that the table is um, arguably the best site for a difficult conversation, um, and I just went with it, right? Like. Um, there weren't a lot of people um, that had decided that the dinner table was their medium. Um, and so it was like when I started, I was like, I'm, my, I'm going to be an artist and an activist, and my medium is going to be dinner, right? Like, it's going to be the table. And it was the, you know, crickets, right? There was, a, there was no um, guild of artists that are working on convening necessarily. Things have changed, but this was a while ago. Um, and so that was about 20 years ago. Um, and so I, when something like the, the dinner table is your medium, you start to, you start, um, like you do with a lot of um, any artist or any practitioner, you kind of start at the surface, like 
you think about, um, you know, for me, like what is the, the lighting, the, the context, the set and setting, um, the food, the invitation, all of these elements, like how did I start, like if you're starting to sculpt, you start to think like, what do I, what does it look like, right? And then you get deeper and deeper into your practice. And then it becomes about, um, you know, what is the energetic heart of your work? And for me, it became clear that conversation is actually um, the substrate that matters at the dinner table. Um, and it determines how people feel, um, what the, how we're having the conversation, how the conversation's being held, how it goes deeper, or how it stays mm -hmm. at surface, actually supersedes um, any of those things. I mean, I think set and setting are important. Um, but the conversation can, can completely make or break the situation. Um, and so I got to understand really like that I, what I was up to was conversation, that it wasn't how we um, eat together. And but then I tried every conversation imaginable, right? So um, uh, genocide, homelessness, wealth disparity, gender inequity, like um, trauma, um, sex, like what can, what can we um, actually talk about? What can the table hold? And the f interesting thing about a table, um, we find these clues in the things that we design um, that are telling us about their nature that we didn't even, um, we didn't think about when we were designing. So if you look at a, a dinner table, um, for some reason, every time we design a dinner table, we design it so just about everybody that's sitting at the table could stand up on top of that table and it can hold their weight, right? It doesn't make any sense, right? Like, why wouldn't we design a table so that it can just hold your Thanksgiving, like, turkey and mashed potatoes? You know, there's like a loaded weight of about 100 pounds that's functional for a table, but we build them so that they'll hold, like, 500 pounds. Like, again and again and again. Like, go into, like, go down the street to, like, a furniture store and get 10 people. You can stand on any of the tables for the most part, right? Um, and for me, that is, like, a, a very clear thing that's been built into the design of a thing which is that the table can hold weight, right? It can hold um, as much emotional weight, um, as much of our persona, much of our pain as, as we can put on it. Um, so I started to learn these things about the table, and then I realized um, along the way that the most effective conversation, so if we're going to kind of like gradiate, like rate what conversation topics um, do the most work, are the most effective, at a table, um, I've, I've already done the research. <laughs> you can save yourself the time. Um, the reveal is it is about end of life. Um, so, and it's like, what is it about that conversation, right, that has that it is um, the most effective conversation at a, at, at a dinner conversation, or a dinner um, table experience. And what I've discovered is it's the quickest way to deep human connection. Right? And now we know that human connection, um, the depth of our community, um, how connected we are equals longevity. Um, like there's a, you know, it's like the number one link to um, longevity. Um, it's also the quickest way to know yourself. Um, so self-knowledge, death is the most effective thing to meditate on if you're interested in self-knowledge. Why? You, well, because of the reveal. Because the, the fact is that, and I, you know, the mechanics of it, you know, you're starting to write about death. I'm s still feel like I'm starting to write about death, but I feel like it's a great mirror. You know, it is what defines us. Um, it's the, the birth of philosophy, every wisdom tradition, et cetera, has this, um, has a death meditation in the center of it. Um, and because it reveals what we value, um, what is most important to us, um, the fact that we're finite. Um, and when we come to accept that. So human connection. Um, so, the, so this is the, what we gain versus what we lose. Um, we gain human connection. Um, we gain self-knowledge. Um, and, and then there's some of the more practical things is this whole room, you know, within 100 years, um, unless um, the folks a little bit down south figure it out and solve aging and senescence, um, are, we're all going to be dead, right? Um, so are we going to be memorialized, remembered, 
Um, is our legacy going to happen the way that we'd like? When we're in our final chapter, are we going to get the things that we want? Um, are we going to get treated the way we want? Are we going to be the place we want to be? Like, so all of that is, is based upon a conversation that you either have or you don't have. Um, no one is going to stumble into memorializing you, running your legacy, um, or, or treating you how you'd want to be if you're innovated, um, or if you lost your voice or some other way. They're not just going to happen upon that. Right? They need to know um, the whole forest of your relationship to your end, um, to your final chapter. And so, um, so, there's, so you, get, and, you, know, you get so many things. And I think let's later talk a, li about, a little bit more about what you get when, when we um, get into the world of literacy, into death literacy. But I don't, I think that maybe I... No, I think that's great. You know, <laughs> I wanted you to talk a little bit about knowing oneself because I, to me that, and you did, but to me that's what's at stake. That if we don't think about the end times, we don't, and like gratitude, I, that word is like the new sustainability or no offense <laughs> to those of you who teach mindfulness or mindfulness, like often these words have like stopped to mean anything in a lot of ways. I think that they yeah. have been like borrowed and said so many times over again. And to me, the one place where all of the feelings behind those words live is inside talks around death and dying because you can't mm. get away from the urgency of being or like this time sensitive notion that like, oh my God, today, 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 we're here right now. Like, let's do something <laughs> with it. And I love those conversations. You, you write in here that no one checks Instagram during a death talk. Like, I am watching you. Uh, <laughs> if, if, well, I say death dinner. I did not sorry, say like lecture. Yeah, you okay, might, fine, you know, you I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you any weight, uh, no guilt on that. But I, but I think that's a legit thing. I mm -hmm. think that we are so distracted now that you have come up with like a beautiful technology of focus. And actually, I would argue with you like, the dinner table to me seems like often way more like varsity level difficult conversation than I had a mentor who works in radio tell me if you want to have any conversation that's hard, do it in the car because you're both looking ahead. Yeah. And like take your mic and like put it next to you and interview people while driving because they d aren't looking you in the eye. And so what you're suggesting here and what you've done so many now hundred more than a hundred thousand times around the world, just so many. Well, people have like I'm not I can't shape shift. Um, well, not you. But yeah. <laughs> you have inspired. Yeah, thankfully. This idea has inspired people. Um, I, the sheer quantity of people that you have um, inspired to have conversation is just staggering. And talk about legacy. Like, you do not need a gravestone. I mean, <laughs> I hope you get a beautiful one. But uh, this enough is amazing. Um, I want to read you a quote in here of your own. That's kind of dark. I hope you're having awkward. fun. This is so much fun for me. Um, <laughs> Page 12. Oh. I haven't seen anyone make notes in one of my books. In oh, the book yet. So I'm like looking over so and all of these things. It's like really exciting. Um, you're quoting Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who, hello, is such a hero. If any of you guys have a chance to see some of her videos, I recently, um, Palliative Medicine Stanford had a palliative care retreat, and they, Ken Ross, who you know, mm -hmm. her son came, and together with Marin Monson, who is a documentary filmmaker and a palliative care physician at Stanford, they screened a couple of short films that she'd made. It was so staggering just watching her body language as she like hops up onto the hospital beds of people and crawls into their lazy boys to have a chat. It's really impressive. Anyway, Elizabeth Kubler Ross once said, it is the denial of death that is partially responsible for people living empty, purposeless lives. For when you live as if you will live forever, it becomes too easy to postpone the things you know you must do. Then you say, to talk about our own mortality and the mortality of our loved ones is to talk about life. Death is the great mirror. Talking about it does not need to be fearsome or morbid. As my fellow Northwesterner Michael Mead so poignantly states, the role of a fully realized human being is to arrive at the door of death having become oneself. I love that so much. Talk to us a little bit about how all of this conversation around death and dying has helped you become who you are. And, and I say that as somebody who yeah. just turned 40 and realizes that that's a process. <laughs> I'm not sure we ever arrive at it, but if you can talk to us a little bit about the process. 
Yeah, I will. And we share this. Um, we both lost fathers um, in, in very different ways um, in our teenage years. Um, and so my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when I was in second grade. Um, and actually, um, he died on, he died with him when I was 13. Um, but, you know, I woke is one of these stories where there's this direct connection between the dying and the living. Um, and, you know, I woke up at 3.43 a.m. Um, and my father wasn't, he was 20 miles away. Looked at the clock, walked down the hall, wondered why I was awake, thought I had to go to the bathroom, I didn't. Came back, went to bed and woke up in the morning and I knew that he'd died. Um, and then, you know, we looked at the, um, at the coroner's report, like 3.43 a.m. is when he died, right? So, but, um, so this is Halloween, and a 13-year-old on Halloween, um, you have some social obligations, right? Like, um, <laughs> it's, it, like there's, some, there's some currency and some capital, and you have to, like, keep paying and playing that game. And so I go to school, because um, that's... There's no, there's no like clear option for my dad died today. What do I do, right? That like we were living um, at that point. The, one of the only bright lights in the end of life space was a little of Kubler Ross. We didn't have this whole good death movement and all of these incredible resources. Um, and so I go to school um, and I don't tell anybody. Um, and that's the thing about death is, um, especially when you're that age. Um, it, it wasn't even, it was less that I didn't want to tell them. It was more that I didn't want to tell them and see somebody fail me, mm. right? Like you have something that's so heavy and hot. You didn't want to, like my girlfriend Francie at the time, who was starting to like flirt with John Nason, right? I still remember, <laughs> like, and I could tell that she had one foot out of this, you know, oh. relationship. And, you know, and it was like maybe kind of appealing to be like, my dad died. You know, like, yeah. come, come on, Can't come on back. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, fuck you, John Nason. All right. <laughs> you got that? Like, um, but I didn't. And I was like, yeah, no, because what if I say that to Francie and then she's like, and then she still flirts with, John. like, now I'm, now I'm, now I'm really, now I'm mad and hurt. Um, and so I, I went through the whole day and then I went out. I went out to think, or to um, Halloween and I put on a costume and we like, TP'd some houses, and we did all of that shit. Um, but something was very different. And it wasn't just that my father had died. It was that the music had skipped a beat. Mm -hmm. Like, I was right there with all my peers. Like, um, I was, you know, right. I, we understood. We were seeing eye to eye. We were doing all of the things. And there wasn't anything but the trajectory of being 13. And then all of a sudden, I was outside of this bubble um, looking in, right? And I literally started, I was self-aware and then watching them. And I was like, you guys are doing some stupid shit. And you're saying some stupid things. Like, and this chasm happened between me and them. Um, and it, there's a lot of things that can get filled in that chasm, right? It's a great opportunity for drugs. It's a great opportunity for any number of things, right? When you have that split between, because of the human connection, between me and my peers was, um, was, was splintered, was missing. Um, and so luckily, um, for what, and I don't even know why I started down this path, I started to get really interested in spirituality. I started to get interested in artists and writers. And I was also very interested in um, high net, like, um, or artists and writers that were deeply connected in creating like amazing things in the world. Um, so that's when I got interested in Otto Rank and Anais Nin and um, Lawrence Durrell and Henry Miller, like this kind of, this group of, of thinkers and artists, I was like, oh, no, they're, st they're like, they're on the same page and they're fucking weird. Like, so it was like, all right, so I'm outside of um, the bubble. And then I was, and then there's obviously the Gertrude Stein, Hemingway, Picasso, and I was like really, really interested in the high, um, frequency um, communities on the fringe um, and started to realize that the fringe is actually what leads the middle, right? So all of these realizations <laughs> as a pretty, as a t teenager, and then I started reading like Thomas Merton and um, Thich Nhat Hanh and like 
you know, and so my bookshelf when I was 15 was a pretty weird bookshelf. Um, and started studying transcendental meditation and like had an out-of-body experience. And so all of this, to say, um, this tragic loss gave me, um, you know, the life I now have, right? Um, and, and it was a very awkward, it wasn't, it became an examined life um, because um, all, because I, I didn't have, um, I didn't have that momentum. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and so, I, you know, and then again and again, what I also started to learn, um, and life has taught me this, um, but is, is the little deaths, is the shedding, right? The process of deciding what isn't serving me um, and how to let that go. Um, and, you know, we used to have this in, um, in a lot of cultures, and, they, and it is isn't still in many cultures, in rites of passage. Um, so, what, I mean, a rite of passage is a death ritual. Um, you know, a, um, when, a, when a teenage boy, um, and I realized this what, the other day because people talk about how there aren't the same rites of passage for women, right? Um, I can't remember the quote exactly, but there is, there's a lot of emphasis on boys having to, um, you know, become men by letting the child die. Um, and that's what this happening on a vision quest, um, in some sense, again and again in a sweat lodge. Um, and, um, and I was like, well, what is the, because women have to let that part of themselves, the childhood going from the attachment-based to an authenticity-based modality. I was like, yeah, giving birth, <laughs> right? Like, pretty clear. Um, you don't even need, like, I was like, why don't we not have rights? I was like, oh, okay, well, when you start growing a child, um, you know, that's a pretty clear design for that time. Um, a part of you, but so it's. I started to kind of throughout time. I've been um, really interested on how um, how death can be part of everyday life. Um, so I love that. I think um, thank God for the arts for so many different reasons, but also because the artists and writers and the musicians that we never meet are the patron saints that help us survive the unsurvivable of our childhoods. And that you can find the people that you may not have in your own family, you may not have in your own community, you may not have a spiritual leader, you may not have a spiritual practice, you know, and you find those people that show you the way. I, I have the same thing. And I think um, to see behind the curtain of mortality before your peers um, is a deeply isolating process. Yeah. And in, I mean, I'm sure even now, you know, well into my midlife, like I'm still one of like, I don't have that many friends who've lost a parent young. You know, I'm still weird. Uh, you know, I, I always will be. You know, and I think when, I actually think that is a rite of passage, too. Mm -hmm. I have to take issue a little bit with the idea of childhood, childbirth. No, being, it is a kind of rite of passage. No, yeah, no, no, take no. It, it is a kind of rite of passage for yeah, women. Yeah. But by the time we get there, and particularly those of us who don't choose to have children, we still have to grow our damn selves up somehow. Oh, for sure. Um, and I think... You know, that is one way, but also we know because so many of us have been poorly mothered that that it also isn't the, the magic sauce, right? Oh, yeah. And I think this is a great thing that being around the, the ill um, and in, involved in conversations around death and dying can give us, which is that I do think death is the final rite of passage um, and coming of age is practice. Um, and so how, how do we practice together? How do we practice in a culture that like really doesn't even talk about death and dying? Thank, thank you for making sure that that is not happening for all of us. But it is uncomfortable. Um, I have a question for you. You know, I want to know what's still hard for you. You write in here about how um, it took you, you'd had how many dinners before you invited your mom and brother to have a dinner with you? Yeah, five years. Five years, that's a lot of yeah. dinners. Yeah. with other people. And I, I wonder, talk to us about what's still hard, what came out of that, why you think, even as someone who is facilitating these conversations for others, for you and your nuclear family, it was still hard. Yeah, well, so, the, so when my father got sick, um, I mean, one of the main reasons I do this work is because, um, and you know, you don't know this at the time, obviously, but um, from the time my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's to the time he died, um, my family, 
my mother did a lot of things right, um, but she handled that really poorly in the sense that we didn't talk about. Um, we didn't know how to talk about his Alzheimer's. We didn't know how to talk about his impending death. Um, and Alzheimer's was a fairly new phenomenon. This is like the 36-hour day had just come out. Um, and it, it literally destroyed um, my family tree. Like, li like that, the family tree, the nuclear family got exploded um, because we couldn't, if we couldn't talk about my father, um, it became this, you know, all-encompassing um, secret almost, this shameful thing at the center. We couldn't even be around each other. Um, and you realize that if you, if you're, you know, when you come near a secret, if you're holding a secret and the topic comes up, um, cortisol surges through your system, right? Um, or if there's something you're repressing deeply and you're coming around. If you have trauma around something and you haven't, you know, and, and you're around that, and then, like, you're dealing with a flooding of cortisol in your system. And so the funny thing about, not funny, but the, um, the thing about it that our, my family separating from each other, my mom and my brother and I, literally de, like, magnets um, being turned the other way um, was the healthiest thing for us to do. Because we didn't have the, the skills. And so it was literally like, this was self-care. That's what it looked like. Um, and so the, um, you know, I, I, the result, unfortunately, well, a couple results is we didn't end up being close. We haven't ever really, I've done a lot of repair, but we're still missing a certain amount of closeness. And I didn't spend time with my dad during his last, um, you know, seven years. Um, and Alzheimer's obviously goes from um, immense clarity to total obfuscation. So the, I, but there was plenty of time for me to get to know my father um, at a very important time of my life. And because it was this shameful thing, I stayed away from it. Um, so after literally going around the world and doing dinners, I was finally like, well, all right. And it was really the book. This is funny because it's like, I can't put this book out into the world if I haven't had this <laughs> Done conversation. It myself. You know, like because you've made a contract, like a book's like a contract with the world in some ways. And I also hadn't done um, all of my end of life documentation, and and I wrote it, I wrote That's it in great. there before I finished it too. And so I was like, okay, set the clock. Like I have until you know October second, and in great. September. I got the shit done. So, like, I have total so, compassion. So this next book needs to be a how to get a book deal so that you do this stuff in this book. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, but, you know, so this is really, it's not like, there's no shoulds in this book or in this work, yeah. right? It's not that, I have total compassion. Your brain's not wired to talk about death. Um, your, your brain is, like, wired to not think about it. Um, you're, you know, it, like, we have cognitive biases around it. Um, it's, you are having a conversation in your head all of the time, um, without doubt. So people are like, he doesn't want to talk about death. My parents don't want to talk about death. The society doesn't want to talk about death. And like, I have a press release for everyone is everybody is talking about death. Everybody in your life is having a conversation about death. I promise you that. Are they sharing that internal conversation in their head with you? Right? Like, that's the question. It's not, are, are they willing? To, they're willing to have the conversation. They're having it. Like, I promise you. Um, and so this whole, like, pointing finger thing, because it happens around this death conversation. Um, she won't, he won't, they won't. Um, and, and, I, and I invite people to say, what needs to change in me so that they'll share an already existing conversation? Because right? that becomes, like, something you have access to. That's something that you can, um, that you can be empowered around um, and affect change around as opposed to waiting for your parents to be ready for the conversation, this projection. And the thing about this, like writing this book and doing this um, project has transformed me in, in so, like I had to get really gentle, right? There's not, it's not, you don't like roll in like, with a lot of bravado or attitude around this topic, like it's like, like holding a little bird or something. Like it is very, very gentle work. And so how do you create that kind of gentle space around a conversation? Um, and how do you have the resilience and the tenacity to 
let people in your life know that you're available for it. Um, long story, long way of saying that yeah, getting my mom and my brother at the table was, um, it was so awkward, right? Like, okay, guy, like, so in it, like, like, itchy sweater, awkward, intimate, weird, like, uh, you know, and my, my brother, um, you know, love him, but I was like, hey, so your son, Finn, um, it's probably best if you're going to bring Finn, let's set him up upstairs with like a movie and a pizza, right? Um, and prepare him for what's happening. Like, is he, oh no, he'll be fine. And like, so Finn, they show up and I was like, did you tell him, did you tell Finn what we're doing? He's like, no, I had a busy day and I didn't prepare. Like, and one of my big rules is you don't ever surprise anybody with this conversation. It's never pizza night, no surprise, it's death dinner. Like, <laughs> like you don't. Fun. <laughs> you don't do it. Like, it doesn't go well. Um, people are like, hey, Thanksgiving is coming up. I've been doing all these radio interviews. Should we turn our Thanksgiving into I was like, are you insane? Like, what, like what? it's already hard enough to be in the same room with family. Like, and you're going to be like, ah, I want to talk about death. No, don't do it. And so you know, Finn sits down, and I was like, so Finn, do you know what tonight's about? Do you know, like, we're going to have a conversation about death? And he was like, why? would you ever ruin an otherwise great dinner with this awful conversation? He slams his plate and he like gets up and leaves. And I, and I was like, so yeah, okay, so that went well. And then <laughs> he comes back down for the entree and he's like, eats it and he's like, while he's eating and putting his, he's like, now let me tell you a few other reasons why this is such a terrible idea, Uncle Michael. You know, that, beside that um, incident, it was like the best dinner I've ever had with my mom and my brother. And it, it, like the medicine, like it's amazing. It's amazing how effective Socratic questions are, for one. Um, the right questions. Um, it's also amazing. Um, the, for me, what is still difficult for me um, is, is always the same. Because um, I don't, I can't, if, if I had to keep being at these death dinners, if I didn't do this one basic thing, it would be, awful, right? Like, like, I've heard every response you could say. I've heard every variety. I've been at hundreds of them. But if I, if I find my edge and find the thing that I'm afraid to say um, and then go there and step over it, you know, because vulnerability is one of those words like gratitude and community. And everybody says it and you have to be vulnerable and like, people don't actually, people don't say, well, what is vulnerability? Like, no one says, hey, let me give you the, you know, the F F FAQ on vulnerability. So it's literally the thing that you're afraid to say, the thing you edit, the thing that's right at your edge that you think about saying, and then you pull back. Vulnerability is stepping over it, right? So, and some people are like, yeah, duh, but really it's just not talked about. And so if I do that, um, well, for one, I'm invested and I've given, and I'm alive, and I've surprised myself, and then other people will go interesting places. So, um, you know, things that, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of, there's plenty of terrain. We all hide stuff. Like, I'm interested in anything that any, that I, that I want to hide. Oh, yeah, and in anyone else, too, right? I mean, those are the sure. most, I think I probably became a writer just so that I could ask people questions they wouldn't normally tell me the answers to. Yeah. Uh, you know, to that end, I think it's so beautiful that you end up writing this book. I think, you know, what we hope for when we write is that we're writing the book that we need the most. Mm -hmm. And I know in my own case, I, there are definitely things I wasn't willing to talk about my family with. Um, but because I had a book deadline, I actually have had to do it. And there's still a really hard conversation around end of life. I'm putting off. I've interviewed like probably 800 people, yeah. um, you know, and my mom is still like the scariest interview. And we have a good relationship. And I know this stuff like, well, um, you know, I think it's so important that we practice it and then also be really freaking vulnerable about it. Um, and tell people where we fall down, which is like the beginning of that dinner was really the hell awkward. Um, yeah. You know, there's no way to do it right. Um, you know, I think that that is an important point that you stress here and that I also want to say, which is, you know, there is now this like whole movement around having a good death, which I think yeah. is beautiful and so important, but also like 
let's not just like Pinterest ourselves into this like idea of having like a beautiful, well lit goodbye. Like I want to hope for that, you know, but I also I'm so worried that we're just setting up ourselves for yet another pressure filled thing we have to do right. Um, you know, and I, I do think that's one thing that you get right here, which is that there's no right answer to these questions. Just the idea that you try to sit down, even if it doesn't go well, um, you know, is worth it. And I, I also do want to say your prompts are amazing. The questions oh, are amazing. You. And I They've think been tested. <laughs> even if you don't ask them of other people, one should ask oneself. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, you say yes, that we are always wandering around thinking about death and talking about death, but worth ourselves. And I think that is kind of true, but I think a lot of us are just being like, don't take me today, don't take me today, don't take, you know, it's not necessarily smart, you know, or like thoughtful. <laughs> it's like cultivated it's like conversation. Anxiety. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and that's a question I have for you, which is like the double-edged sword of like having an early loss and having that crystallize you into like becoming a baby theologian and spiritual <laughs> practitioner and then for inviting the world to dinner and making this beautiful thing for the rest of us. I know with me, you know, uh, losing my dad really young and seeing behind that curtain has been the engine behind the things I'm most proud of and hardest to accomplish. And I've lived like my life is on fire since I was 17. I'm yeah. tired. <laughs> um, but uh, it also sucks. Like, I'm also always waiting for, like, the great piano to, like, fall out of the sky onto someone that I love. And, like, how on earth? Do we balance that? Like an awareness of our own mortality with also seizing the day and being grateful and everything else. Like sometimes I just want to pretend death isn't real. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the equation's no good, right? Like, I mean, it's just not good that we lose people we love. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I had, do um, uh, you know Jun Yun? No. Oh, um, no, but I love, I, I love the part about him. Yeah, so um, there is this great um, festival that'll come back to San Francisco called Reimagine End of Life. Um, and they just, it just happened in New York. And um, the first year when it was here, um, I uh, had Ira Bayak, who's this incredible writer, um, an end of life um, writer, and he's a um, palliative care physician, um, and one of, in many ways the father of palliative care in this country. Um, or one of um, the um, originators of the work, and um, and a huge humanist, and um, and then Jun Yun, who's um, uh, you know started the Longevity Fund, and he's interested in curing aging, and um, we had this incredible false dichotomy set up that Ira thought was a real dichotomy that he was going to come and talk to. Um, uh, June about um, you know what's wrong with his vision and why wouldn't he just accept his mortality and this kind of like arrogance of the Silicon Valley um, wanting to solve death because they couldn't face it um, you know all, and literally Iowa just came with all of these projections onto June and like your fragile ego like it was all and what wasn't said directly was said you know um, very cleverly and Ira is very clever. And he was completely disarmed by June when June was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not doing this work for myself. Um, this is for my grandchildren. He's like, because I got interested in um, extending life because losing the people that I love hurt so bad, right? And it was like, so it's not for me, and it's about heartbreak. You know, and I was just like, <laughs> like I was like falling through air. Like how this was not how I expected it to go, um, you know. So, but remind me which direction we that. No, no. Now I'm now I'm doing the IRA. No, no. Um, it's beautiful. It brings me to another question. One of your prompts, which I like, and I think it's funny, precisely because we're sitting near Silicon Valley right now, um, is that question about extending life. So. Um, if you could extend your life, how many years would you add? 20, 50, 100, forever. And so many of the people that you then talk about, each prompt, the way the book is set up is you have a prompt and then you have a chapter where he goes and talks to a lot of people and kind of locates the prompt in the habitat, um, in the mm -hmm. field. Um, yeah. That's one thing, that, that question really struck a chord with me, which is, you know, I'm already, because I'm more, maybe more attuned to loss, I'm already sad. Like, 
when I fall in love with someone or when I make a new friend, like wrapped up in that is like, oh God, you know, like you're gonna die one day, you know. <laughs> I've only known you an hour, but one day you're gonna die and this is gonna suck. Uh, you know, it's, it makes me uh, pause around the idea of extending life and a lot of people you talk to talk about that, which is the fear and, and we see it with now, some of us are living a long time. You know, even my grandmother, she lived to 98. She outlived all of her friends and was so lonely. And by the end was just like, take me now. You know, no one here remembers my childhood. I'm the one, like, I, I am the carrier of all the memories. Like, that looks so lonely to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's what we were talking about. The equation's not good. Um, so it's, you know, the, so what can we get out of this, this thing that's just not good? Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, I'm really interested, and I've just started to, um, spend time with this um, psychologist in New York, Jordana Jacobs, um, and she's um, been doing work around how death consciousness, well, actually how death and the relationship between death and love, um, right, that our capacity to love is, um, is com completely entwined with, the f with death. Um, and so, you know, and I, I'm just at the beginning of thinking through that and like terror management theory and um, and this kind of, instead of um, the Ernest Becker, um, that everything we do um, is because of our fear of death, that, that there's a more, um, again, humanist um, route into death consciousness. And if we can show that um, our, um, our capacity to forgive, to love, um, is, is heightened via um, turning towards our mortality, you know, that, you know, when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's the ticket. You know, because I, um, I just taught at Kripalu, um, which, you know, like all of these spiritual teachers have taught at Kripalu has been this huge destination for the last, like, um, 40, 50 years. Kripalu has never held a workshop on death. Wow. Never in its history. They're like, this is the first one, you know, and, you know, wow. and it was like, and you know, we had a good crowd, but it wasn't like we, we weren't pushing people away. It was like, how do we get people to come and, and have, like, death over dinner works because there's food and that's kind of, you know, or something. <laughs> um, but so now I'm trying to, like, really think that if it's a pathway to love, um, then, then I think that we completely change the game. I agree um, with you. I think it's, to me, it's a pathway to love. And the only way to love is to be very, very brave. So that once you realize that like the sky piano can come in any second and you choose to love anyway, like it's so delusional and yet I cannot stop. Like it is the best thing. And I think until you have internalized your mortality and everyone around you, whether that is like, you know, you can really practice on pets. Like they are just, I, people say that with kids, but it's just true if you ever love an animal, unless you love a tortoise. Um, <laughs> because that is that you will never mourn that tortoise. That tortoise will only maybe, probably not, mourn you. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, the best thing, at least for me, I guess I answered my own question around that, yeah. is that it makes me brave. It, sometimes delusionally so. Um, but I will not miss an opportunity to tell someone what I think or largely what I, when I care about them. And I do, you know, whether I like it or not, I do think about a lot of my conversations as the last conversations. And that could be morbid, but I think that makes me a better friend. You know, I've led people down all kinds of other ways. Um, but I definitely do. I, I say I love you first in a relationship almost always. Um, and I say it really loud. Uh, you know, yeah. tell it all you. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think for me that's been helpful. And, you know, my dad was sick. He was diagnosed with bone cancer when I was three, but he didn't die until I was 17, so halfway through my senior year of high school. And throughout that, we never knew how long we were going to have. We would get, like, six months, and then we'd get four years, and then we'd get a year. And he was, like, uh, I think if he had not been ill, he would have never told me he loved me. Like, he was, like, very buttoned down, kind of hmm. austere, sort of Mad Men, 1950s masculinity. And uh, he got a terminal diagnosis, and it was like, you couldn't shut him up. Um, you know, and I, my mom talks about it now, which is that she was like, I don't know if we would have stayed married if he hadn't gotten sick, which is not wishing him sick, but is like, you know, he couldn't articulate his feelings. 
And the fear of death was so present and so intense that it forced him to talk about it. Yeah. You know, the, the secret that I want to unlock is like, how on, in the hell do we do that without the terminal diagnosis? Yeah. You know, and maybe that's where like more beautiful sound baths come in and near death experiences and hallucinogenics, hello CIS. Yeah. Um, you know, but we need those experiences to scare us in a way maybe that death doesn't. I don't know. But you, what, what do you do? Well, I mean, we're talking about practicing dying. Um, and certainly, you know, there's a lot of that within psychedelics and ceremony work. The other thing that I think is really important for us to identify is we've moved death out of our um, experience, right? So we used to be confronted with um, family members, um, we, and, and if you were in war, you you know you would be much more confronted with death than we are now. We do everything kind of long distance and sealed up and hermetically. And, and I and I'm not saying like we should reintroduce a lot of <clears throat> uh, dead bodies in our presence. Um, but there is, <clears throat> there's a thing that we're lacking, and that's literacy. Um, and so we've become death illiterate because we're not, we, because we don't have encounters with it. And so the, the problem with um, being death illiterate is like any other kind of literacy issue. When you're not literate, when you don't have literacy, you don't have access to making empowered, agentic decisions, right? So there's this relationship between agency and literacy. We're all going to be in difficult conversations at some point with doctors, insurance, lawyers, etc., family members, wills. Everybody will encounter this. Um, your comfort level, your literacy level on the basic topic will determine how much agency that you have in the conversation, right? So that's just like we have a, we have a vested interest um, in not just our comfort level but our ability to express ourselves and have agency. Um, and to have the people around us have that kind of agency. Now, there's a, there's a more fun level to it, um, which is um, with that literacy around death, we get access to metaphor. All right, so we've stripped death from our consciousness to the point that it's not in our language um, where we think that transformation is going to CrossFit or something. Like, I mean, and we don't even understand transformation as a culture that's obsessed with it, like especially the city like obsessed with transformation. Um, but transformation has death at the very center of it. It looks like you die and you get reborn. It looks like some part of yourself you leave behind in some new place. It looks like, you know, fall becoming spring turning, you know, coming winter turning into spring. Um, and we don't even know, like there is a whole um, invisible world that, and, and it's not even just like, I got literate and that's cool and now I'm walking around with death literacy. It's like the last person speaking a language or people that are spread out speaking a language does not create um, an exciting um, sense of opportunity and meaning making that's shared. Like it needs, we all need to elevate this up. I think somebody recently was, was you know, as when you come up with a book you're on like, 300 podcasts or something, right? And so you're like, okay, let's, let's say, what's the question? And I was like, what is the meaning of life? And I was like, oh, wow, that's an amazing question. Um, well, here's the thing. I was like, I think we live in such a low vibrational culture um, that it's like asking a suburban tree about a forest, mm -hmm. right? Tell me about the wisdom of a forest tree, right? Like that's, don't ask me a question, like an existential question right now. Because I'm not part of a high vibrational network. I'm a part of a pretty high vibrational network on a very low vibrational planet. But like the Vedas get written, right, in a high vibrational net, like community. Like so we have a like let's, and it's happening and consciousness is raising. But like some of these really important questions we can't even can start to ponder until the system, you know, starts to become more of like a forest. Like a forest will tell, you know, a, through from species, across species, will let each other know about a fire, you know, miles and miles away, or opportunity for water, or these things. Like, information and knowledge crosses the membrane of species. Like, we can't even communicate to the same, like, people in our apartment complex, right? Like, <laughs> oh, it's probably time for Q&A, but yeah, yeah go for it. Um, we 
reading history. Because I think even if you can't take yourself away from your regular life and go and spend time on the mountaintop alone because you've got to go to work in the morning and pick up the kids or whatever it is, I, I was just in New Orleans last week and I went on the, like, one of those like ubiquitous cemetery tours. Mm -hmm. But it was so profound, it was so amazing. I realized that the 7 Eleven was on top of a burial that had 70,000 bodies in it. And that is true here too. We are all walking around on cemetery tours and not aware, yeah, you know. Yeah. And, and I think that's part of it too, which is like actually internalizing the fact that like we're here on borrowed for a lot of different reasons, on borrowed time, on borrowed space, and that we die to make room for everyone that is going to come after us. And we have come up with such a strange contemporary <coughs> life where we're kind of outside of that circle. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's kind of have to be here, like we wouldn't be checking email and doing the things. Um, you know, it's too exquisitely painful and heightened awareness to be in that place all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think well, having these that, conversations allows us to do that. It even, does. Even briefly, and, and pausing and like gathering over bread, um, or whatever, food for whatever. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, the time, but also this. So, it's, so when you just say, um, uh, "What well, it's a taboo," the word taboo um, has a couple people etymologically put it to a couple different things. Um, one is menstruation, um, but the other thing that um, taboo is what some people claim is absolutely the root of is a place um, that is um, sacred um, and that you need to prepare yourself before you go into. So we've like turned this like taboo like stay away. It's like no no no. It's a heightened place, right? Like it's a heightened opportunity. So I think we're um, let's do some Should Q and A. Should we do some answers? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Who has a question? Of course. And thanks for coming. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.